music school. We are now in Studio 5, one of the many rooms that students can book anytime to run sessions throughout their studies. This room is equipped with a wide range of classic synth and more modern synth from Juno to Nordlead, etc. Uh, all hooked up to a desk and also fully equipped Mac uh, monitoring, etc. So this whole setup is very much like a home studio. And today's video is about how to set up your home studio to help you making decisions when it comes to purchasing equipment, uh, where to set it up, how to set it up. So we're going to start with the room itself. Maybe you'll have the luxury to have a dedicated room in which you can maybe do some work, in which case you'll be able to optimize it. Or like many starting musicians, you may have to work in your bedroom or living room. And when it comes to acoustic, uh, there are certain things that may help you to uh, deal with some of the classic problems inherent to having speakers playing at, at a high level in, in a room. So the first thing to consider is the, the positioning where you're going to set up your system. Ideally, you want to have an equilateral triangle between you, the listener, and your speakers. So equal distance between you and both speakers left and right. Avoid corners at all times. So what you don't want is one speaker is in one corner and the other speaker against the, the back wall, for example. Um, corners attract low frequency. So you would have a, something very unequal in terms of the bass response in your room. Also, you want to try to be not too close to the back wall where your speakers are. But again, most room you don't have a choice and you will find that in most home studio you're going to have your speaker against the back wall. It's not too much of a problem if you treat behind the speakers and also if the port of the speakers are not at the back. So in that scenario, front ported speakers is better. One of the big considerations is also parallel wall. Parallel wall is what triggers what is known as standing waves. So you've got the sound coming out of the speakers, bouncing from the back wall, coming back, the waves meet somewhere in the middle, and then you're getting all sorts of phase cancellation, or some frequency may sound louder than they actually are, because they meet at different points. One of the main things you can do is treat the corners of the room, break the room, so you don't have flat surfaces everywhere. By breaking the walls, you're gonna disperse the sound in the room. That will help getting something a bit better. So in this room, for example, what we have done is we've put bass traps behind the speakers. So it deals with uh, bass frequency coming out the back of the speakers. At the back of the room, behind the listening position, we've put some big bass trap as well to try to absorb some of the frequency because the room is quite narrow, we wanted to make sure the frequencies, the bass, especially low frequency, wouldn't come back and create too many problems. So those large absorbers help a lot. Uh, one thing we've done as well is typically corners in the room. This is where a lot of problems also happen. Uh, resonance and, and, and rings um, just because of those corners. So if you can break those, so here we've put absorbers uh, in that position to break the straight angle, if you like. One thing that can be very efficient as well is absorbing above the monitoring. So again, what you're trying to do is, once you've defined your positioning in the room, the sound is absorbed pretty much and feels a bit more controlled. What you aim is to listen to the sound of the speakers, not the sound of the room. In this room, we've used a package um, from a company called Geek Acoustic. They do lovely bass traps, really easy to install. You can literally hang them up with a, <laughs> with a nail and hang them up against the wall. Uh, on the ceiling, we used brackets to fix them. But it's, we're talking minimal DIY here. Uh, however, if you not in a situation where you can yet put some treatment, um, just real thing can help. Typically in studios, you're all often going to have a sofa at the back of the room. If you think of a sofa, it's a big foam uh, piece of furniture. Uh, it's going to be ideal to absorb bass frequency. Also, what can work sometimes I've found is shelves, just shelves with a lot of books. Um, again, that's breaking the flat wall because books in a shelf can be different dimensions, different shape and sizes. Again, every sound that's going to eat that shelf is going to disperse going back in the room helping prevent problem with standing waves. Real purpose studio tends to have angled walls. In normal habitation, you're going to deal with flat walls. So anything you can help with that will make a huge difference. So the first piece of equipment that you're looking to buy is probably going to be a computer. Nowadays, most home studios are going to be centered around a computer loaded with a DAW software. And that will be the brain of your studio, where you record audio, MIDI, mix in the box, etc, etc. So, you have really two choices when it comes down to computers, Mac and PCs. 
the first thing you're going to need to consider is the processor speed. Uh, usually it's in gigahertz, but also the type of processing power. So is it an i7, is it an i5, Intel, what kind of processor? The more processing you have, the more plug-in virtual instruments you can load into your DAW. By the time where you reach the final mix of your project with a lot of plugins, your computer will be taxed uh, extensively. The second thing to consider is the RAM. And the RAM is going to allow you not only to open more applications at the same time, it also allows you to load more samples into your sampler. And typically a lot of music library uh, with contact, for example, of strings, piano, drums, are often sample based. So it makes sense to have enough RAM to load bigger libraries. Thirdly, the hard drive. The hard drive has, has also an impact on your, how fast your computer runs and can handle music. An SSD, for example, is becoming the norm nowadays, or at least a fusion drive, which is somewhere a hybrid between a hard drive and an SSD. So the faster the, the drive, not only the computer boots up quicker, it just works better, uh, but also when you record audio, that means you can read and write more audio tracks. So quite useful if you start working with a lot of audio. So on the PC front, if you're looking at a laptop, starting at about 800 pounds, I think you can get a decent PC laptop, well specced enough, and about 1200 pounds you'll get some pro specs for music. I think you know you cannot consider the, the kind of 300 pounds PC, they're, they're not designed for music purposes. In terms of the desktop, I would say starting from about 700 pounds, and if you go up to 1300 pounds, then you're gonna get a really, really good PC for music. On the Mac front, um, the best value is probably an iMac. There's a quad-core i5 3 gigahertz at the moment, uh, which is at about 1200 pounds, 1250, which is really good value, and you can upgrade it at to an i7 3.6 for about 1600 pounds. So that's for me the best value. However, you may have to be mobile and therefore consider a laptop. You would need a MacBook Pro entry level at 1250, it's an i5. Perfectly fine to start with, but if you start using more CPU intensive virtual instruments such as Reactor, for example, or, or some heavy library in contact, then I think an i7 core is going to be needed, Intel core. So in that case, you're looking at 1800 pounds with a MacBook Pro and upwards above 2000. You know, being mobile with a computer uh, means you can go and play gigs, live performance, which if you're a DJ uh, musician, producer, is quite useful to have. Also, you can work while traveling. So it has many advantages, but you have to bear in mind that for some specification, mobile computer slash laptop are always going to be more expensive. One more thing to consider about the computer, the latest Macs are all USB-C, which is Thunderbolt 3 as well. There are hardly any devices yet compatible with that connectivity. So that implies buying adapters. So this is what you're going to need to consider when purchasing a computer. DAW, standing for Digital Audio Workstation. I think it's fair to say that the most used in electronic music maybe and in home studio in general are going to be Logic, Ableton Live, Pro Tools, Cubase, Reason, Fruity Loop. Logic is, by, is manufactured now by Apple, developed by Apple, and only works on Mac. So if you plan to use Logic, you will need a Mac computer. There's no way around, around that, unless you use a PC and use a system called Hackintosh. But in my opinion, uh, I've seen system with that and ran into so many problems that I wouldn't go there personally. Apple Mac comes with GarageBand, and GarageBand is effectively a light version of Logic does a lot less, uh, but still does enough. If you want just to dabble into music production, that may be a starting point for you. Uh, and then you can upgrade to Logic later on and the project will be compatible. Ableton Live is an interesting piece of software because it's, I would say, it really stands apart from all the others. Cubase, Logic, Pro Tools all work in a very similar way. Uh, very linear from bar one and you're progressing horizontally on your timeline. Although Ableton Live can do that, Ableton Live also has the clip view, uh, session view, which is very different and quite unique. Uh, the first choice for many electronic producers, if you're thinking about performing live with a computer, Ableton Live is probably the software to consider. 
all the other software apart from Logic are all compatible. They can work on with Windows or with Mac OS X or, or in any other system that you have. Also, something to consider is, do you plan to do video work? Pro Tools works well with video. Logic works well. Ableton also, but maybe has less features in terms of what you can do with your video. Most software now nowadays come bundled with soft synth, uh, virtual instrument, uh, plugin, a simulation of compressor, reverb, EQ, ev you know, everything you need in your studio. The package may also have an important influence in, in what you're choosing. I mean, one of the advantages of Logic, for example, is it's only 140 pounds, I believe, now on the App Store. Um, one of the reasons Logic, you know, Apple was able to do it that cheap, I suppose, is that if you go for Logic, you're going to buy your Mac anyway. So it kind of makes sense. That's all part of the whole e same ecosystem. All the other software, Cubase, Pro Tools, Ableton, they're all priced around the 400, between 400, 5, 550 price. Monitoring is probably one of the most critical and important aspects because any decision you make is based on what you hear. And if what you listen to is not accurate, then the decision you're going to make are, are not going to be the right ones. You know, whether you're putting too much bass or putting something too loud and it should be quieter, things like that. So monitoring in music production is absolutely vital. And often beginners, the first thing they start maybe cutting corners on are the speakers and the sound card. I'm going to forget the high end, the very high end, which is several thousands and thousands of pounds. And I'm going to focus on the, what I call an entry budget and a kind of a mid-budget. First thing you need to consider is how it connects to the computer. And again, that is very much linked to the choice of computer. So some sound card going to con connect via USB, others via Firewire, uh, Thunderbolt. And, and usually, the faster the connection to the computer, the better bandwidth, the more track you can run, uh, maybe the higher sample rate and things like that. The other thing you're going to need to consider is how many inputs, outputs do you need and what types. If you're only literally working in the box and only programming synth and mostly working everything with MIDI and instruments within your computer, you may just need two outputs, literally feeding your speakers to listen to what you do. Typically, the more inputs and outputs drives the prices up. What type of inputs and outputs? Are you going to record microphone? If you need microphone, you're going to need two amp them. So you're going to need microphone preamp. Also, what kind of line output? Do you need digital input, etc, etc. Another thing to consider is the quality of the converters. Any sound card has an input, analog input. The signal is then sampled and digitized with zero and ones. And on the other hand, those digital numbers are transformed back into analog audio that we can hear. The quality of those are going to have a huge, huge impact on both your recording and on what you monitor. And obviously, the lower the budget, usually, the quality of the converters are not going to be as good. And it's a big difference between high-end professional and entry level. Another thing to consider is the sample rate. A better sample rate is known to have a better definition in the top end. In reality, very, very good sound cards are probably still going to sound better at 44 than not as good sound card at 192. And the spec, you know, how much noise, ratio noise uh, do you have on your sound card, how much dynamic range, etc., before it distorts. All those kind of things, very important. And in the entry budget, you've got Presonus, Native Instrument, Akai, EIE, Audient, Motu, M Audio, Roland, Stenberg. All those manufacturers do very decent sound, uh, sound card in that kind of price range. Uh, the one we've decided to pick is the Focusrite Scarlett, the 2i2, priced at 130, I believe. It has two inputs with two mic pre's, so you can put in line instrument, mic, mic pre's XLR. Uh, it has phantom power for condenser microphone. It has two outputs and it's a USB connection. No need for a driver. One of the reasons we, cho we, we choose it is it's probably one of the best quality and easy to use and built for, for that price, in our opinion. This is the sound card that uh, we give as an entry 
package to our students on the diploma. Um, we, we provide speakers, sound card, and uh, a controller keyboard. So that's the sound card we've decided. It also has a monitor control, so that means you can control the level of your speakers, as well as uh, a direct monitoring, which allows you to listen to the recording uh, without latency. So now, let's consider the mid-budget audio interface. And what I mean by mid-budget, some of them may be two inputs, some of them are may be eight within the same kind of bracket, so it's not quite fair. You should really compare for equal number of inputs, I guess. Uh, and then usually the price reflects a little bit more in terms of the build quality. But uh, for the sake of argument, mid-budget I'll consider roughly any, anywhere between 500 to roughly a thousand pounds. The manufacturers that I would recommend considering in that mid-budget are Universal Audio, Apogee, with the Apogee Duet, so both Apollo Twin and Apogee Duet are two input. Uh, Metric Halo are two input, but they're slightly higher budget, we're talking about 1200 here. RME, uh, the Babyface, uh, and a lot of different models. We've chosen one that, is, in our opinion, is probably the best in that mid-budget. It's the Apollo Twin by Universal Audio. Not only because of its amazing sound quality, but also the range of features that suddenly brings a whole new way of working. The new version, the MK2, is a Thunderbolt connection. You have the, the MK2 is the latest Thunderbolt version. Uh, you also have a USB version for Windows. It has two inputs, analog inputs, which can accommodate line input balance or mic prees, so you can plug two microphones. It has four outputs, uh, analog outputs, so you can feed two different type of recorder or two different type of speakers. It also has a low level input for guitar on the front and a headphones here at the front. In my opinion, in that price range, first of all, you're getting the quality that you would normally get with 2,000 pounds converters. They're really, really good converters. They are becoming the standard in recording studios. Very, very good quality mic prees. Very clean and very transparent. Uh, so if you're after that kind of transparent sound. You have also a monitor control for your headphones, for your monitors. Um, you can literally control everything there and it controls the software. It comes with this software console version 2, which I love the look of. I have to say, you know, for me, it looks like an old school mixing console. So it makes total sense. Uh, very easy to use. It also has a quite a comprehensive monitoring section, which is very useful. You can listen in mono, uh, you can mute, you've got even a talkback to talk to people. If, let's say, you've got a vocalist in the other room, you can talk to them, communicate, as you would with a normal console. And in many cases, you may end up having to have a piece of equipment like that one. That is the Mackie, the big knob. Uh, it's basically a volume control, but again, you can mute, you can dim, make it lower. Uh, you've got a talkback as well. You can plug several pair of speakers uh, for different monitoring. You will find that that is very useful to have um, in a studio environment when you move forward in your production. So the fact that you have all of that, all of these features embedded in that sound card is a massive plus. Universal Audio includes a dedicated DSP to run their own plugins. Not only you benefit from all those different functions, but you can load plugin uh, that doesn't take power from your computer. And, and for those of you in, who know, uh, Universal Audio has specialized in emulation of quality uh, professional studio standard equipment such as 1176, Neve 1073, um, LA2A compressors, Fairchild, plate reverb, etc. etc. One of the big features of the Apollo Twin is also the Unison technology, and that is, doesn't exist on any other sound card. This technology means that the preamp is modeled. So if you look at here, for example, I've got my preamp, um, and I can basically choose a dedicated preamp simulation. So I could plug a microphone in input one, for example, and actually have a wide range of different type of preamps that normally would cost several thousands of pounds. So I can choose to have an API channel and suddenly I've got Compre API Mac Pre. They are known for their kind of punch and, and cleanness and in your face sound, uh, but also comes with the EQ compressor. You could have the Manley Vogue box, which is again a box that costs about 2,500 pounds. You could have a classic 
Neath N73, one of the most famous uh, mic preamps. By having a very transparent mic pre's, it suddenly makes it very usable to model, as if you were recording through those very expensive mic pre's. The mic pre is a big part of the sound, as much as, as the mic almost, you know. So, Having this facility within the sound card is absolutely invaluable. Now, the Apollo Twin comes in uh, three different uh, DSP power. Uh, what it means is that you have more DSP power, therefore you can use more plugins. You can record the audio with those plugins, so you could decide to have a compressor, an EQ, a Mac Pre, and record the sound into your DAW with those, as if you were using the real hardware. And then you can also use all the plugins during your mix project. So all of those features are the reason why we've, we've chosen the Apollo Twin as our, our mid-budget sound card. Next thing to consider is speakers and, and monitoring in general. First of all, active versus passive. Active speakers typically come with their own amp built-in, uh, whereas passive require an amp to drive them. I would suggest that when you start, it probably makes sense to have an active, uh, just because the amp has been really designed for that speaker. Second things to consider is the size and design. What I mean by size is the bigger the driver, the bigger the speaker itself. And obviously the bigger the driver, the better bass response you're getting. Uh, whereas smaller speakers tend to use technology to try to give you the bass, but obviously it may not be as accurate. There's no point having a huge speaker in a tiny room, because you're never going to drive them uh, as they should be driven up to a certain extent. Accuracy and how it translates. All manufacturers tend to claim flat response, therefore meaning there's no coloration on the, on the speakers, so it should be accurate. In reality, it doesn't quite work that way. The placement of the speaker is going to be very important in your home studio. Uh, typically, you're going to want that perfect triangle, like we've discussed uh, in the intro to this video. Also, there's a port that helps to make a smaller speaker be able to play some bottom end that normally wouldn't be there. Some speakers have a design with a port at the front or at the back. If it's back against the back wall, you're going to have a lot of bass frequency resonance going against the back wall, creating a lot of mess with your bottom end, well, your bass response in the room. And also, one thing you can consider is headphones. Can I work with headphones only? I think when it comes to music, first of all, it can be tiring working on headphones for hours and hours and hours. It can be useful to have alongside your pair of speakers. Uh, ideally, you may want two pair of speakers, maybe a cheaper one, a small one. Traditionally in studio, NS10 are, are still very famous in recording studios, just because the way they work on the mid um, makes you work a certain way and are very accurate in analyzing levels in general, I find. But you may need other speakers to work with bottom end and top end. Also, monitoring control. Some sound cards don't have any monitoring control, therefore you have to go into your DAW and what you end up doing is turn down the output of your mix. This is not the best way to go about it, because that means you're not fully utilizing the output of your sound card. So, ideally, a, a monitoring section that gives you a volume knob, like the Apollo Twin has, uh, the Focusrite has, uh, but also other functions, for example, plugging several speakers, like I, like I mentioned, the Apollo Twin can do that. Uh, a talkback to be able to talk to somebody, but mono, mute, dim, all of those functions are really, really important when you mix. You always need to check your mix in mono. So, you're going to either need a dedicated monitoring control, and Mackie do some uh, at a reasonable price. They start at 70, and the second model is about 270, I think, or 280 pounds. You're going to have other models more expensive, like the SPL, for example. They can go up to 800 pounds just for the control. Uh, the high end can go to 2,000 pounds in some mastering rooms, for example. But again, one of the reasons we like that sound card, it, it has all built in. So, in terms of speaker choices, uh, again, we've made a choice of entry-level speakers, and we've gone with the KRK, those are the, the Rocket speakers. They are very popular among electronic music producers, partly because of the price. Again, we are talking about 250 for the entry model, so very good. For the mid-budget speakers, uh, we've decided to go with the Adam, a7X. And we have those in a couple of rooms at Pond Blank. We also have the bigger model, the A77X, which is a three-way speaker. They are mid-budget because they're about 800 pounds, but again, those, it's one of those speakers that are very, very accurate for the price and, and trans seems to be translating really well. I love the ribbon tweeter. It gives you something really nice in the stereo picture. In that price range, again, you have 
Focal, Genelec, uh, Dyna Audio. But in that price range for me, the, uh, I did find the A7X working really, really, really well. You have speakers that can go up to 8,000 and in mastering rooms up to 40, 50,000 pounds. I've often heard beginners, you know, producers who are getting into the game and building their first home studio saying, oh, I, I, I've bought the computer, I've bought the sound card and I, I'm going to get the, as cheap speakers as I can. And it's kind of almost the wrong way around in a way. I mean, for me, you're almost better with a computer which is maybe not as powerful and you always find ways of, of working around. But the quality of the converters of the sound card and the speakers, for me, is the key to how you're going to work, how, the, how it's going to translate, how, how your music is going to play outside once you take it out of your home studio. One other piece of equipment that is not vital, but I would strongly recommend that you consider, is a MIDI controller keyboard. You could literally enter MIDI with a mouse and just enter notes. Or, or on some computers like the Mac and Logic, for example, that there's a little keyboard and you can use your numerical and alphabetical keyboard, literally as a, as a keyboard, but it, it's not playable. And if you are a keyboard player or if you are a musician, you're probably going to want to be able to input some of your parts um, and actually play them. So you're regaining, your, you know, you're keeping that feel, you know, you're, that, that's your thing as a musician. Well, they're basically um, devices that output MIDI notes that then connect to your virtual instruments in your DAW or like other synth here, like, you know, here we've got a Juno 106. Those are real instruments and they have their own keyboard. But for example, if we have a, a rack, like this room here, we've got a, an old rack, for example, there's no keyboard. So you would need to play the notes somehow to trigger the sound in that box. And it's the same in, in, in the, your DAW. You can have some with pads that are great for drums. In addition to that, some MIDI controllers have other features, such as rotary controllers. And that can be really useful to control plugins, for example. Typically in electronic music, a filter that you know you use gonna use extensively on, on a range of instruments. So you can open up, close your filter. But lots of different things, so you get a more hands-on approach rather than just making music with a mouse or, or a trackpad. Most MIDI controllers nowadays are, are equipped with USB and are very much plug and play. Uh, some like those ones have their own drivers because you can modify a little bit more what it does. So effectively to connect them, although they transmit MIDI notes, MIDI data, they connect via a USB cable that you plug into your, your computer. But some of them may also give you MIDI output. And the MIDI is a five, the DIN uh, that connects all the kind of old school MIDI connections. It may be useful to have one that also does MIDI if you plan to integrate further hardware equipment or older equipment uh, pre-USB. One of the entry level that we provide to our students alongside the KRK, the Scarlett, is the Novation Launch Key. Uh, as you can see, it has eight faders, nine actually with the, fa uh, with the master. You're getting transport control, so you can press play, stop, your, your DAW. It has pads and obviously a key. So good entry level, well built. Uh, the launch key is totally integrated with every DAW, but launch key works great with Ableton as well to launch some of the clips, for example. Another one that we like very much is the complete control from uh, Native Instrument. The Native Instrument 1 control it works really great, especially if you start using complete, for example. Also have lovely lights, uh, gives you scales, and can be really useful even to learn music. So those are the two MIDI controllers that we recommend for both entry and mid-budget. So if you plan to record a lot of musicians, a lot of audio, you may need to consider having a, a, a range of microphones. Maybe you're going to record, you know, your friends who plays percussion or guitar or, or a vocalist. Again, a lot of range of microphone. But for your basic studio, if you're going to have one all-round mic to record guitar, let's say acoustic guitar and vocal and a bit of percussion, a condenser may be a better choice. And condenser can start at a low price if you look at uh, manufacturers like SE Electronics, for example, are, are making some really, really good entry-level microphone. Then you can start getting into the, the more reputable uh, brands such as Neumann, uh, a T TLM 102 or TLM 103 getting into the six, seven, eight hundred pounds, but are going to give you again a very professional result. One thing to consider about condenser mic is they're more sensitive to noise around. So maybe a condenser is not going to do the job for you because it was gonna, it's going to pick up much more of the noise outside. 
Another uh, option is a dynamic mic. Usually they are designed for live, but also to take more SPL, uh, sound pressure level. So, you know, uh, an instrument that is louder, like a drums. Uh, you've got to be careful with a condenser. A dynamic may be a good choice. An uh, all-round mic that absolutely is almost considered uh, vital to any mic collection will be a Shure SM58. Uh, it's an all-round mic. It can be used for vocal, it can be used for drums, it can be used for such a wide range of instruments, electric guitars, etc. Okay, so now that we've got all our, all our hardware, one thing to consider is, is connecting all together. Those sound cards, both the, the Scarlett Focusrite and, and the, uh, the Universal Audio Apollo Twin, have balanced outputs. Uh, some of the speakers can have both balanced and unbalanced and, and work at different uh, nominal levels. Some work at plus 4, minus 10. So it is important to connect properly. So if you're leaving balance here, you want to go balance on the other hand as well. Uh, the balance on both speakers tend to be XLR and that means balance you can run longer cables. It's a professional way of working, whereas unbalanced and, and working at minus 10 I, I, is considered semi-professional. Also, the quality of the cables, you know, again, I've seen so many people suddenly cutting corner on the cable and you end up with a really cheap phono, uh, three pounds phono from around the corner to connect everything and you've spent all, those, all this money on your equipment. Again, cable quality is going to make a big difference. Additional virtual instruments. There's a lot of companies out there. Native instrument with complete. It's going to give you pretty much the entire range. Uh, students at Pont Blanc get 50% discount. You've got Arturia, the whole collection, emulating classic synth. They're absolutely great. And it's the same for uh, plugin, such as compressor. Uh, you may have heard of Waves, for example. You know they've been around for a long time. They make amazing plugin. Uh, Eventide, simulating some classic hardware from the studio. And obviously Universal Audio. With Universal Audio you need a card. So either, either you've got a, a DSP card, just dedicated for your plugin, or an audio card. And, and if you're going to go for Universal Audio, I think it makes sense to, to get an Apollo because you get the DSP and the sound card all in one, which would be cheaper than getting the same quality converters and, and a dedicated satellite or, or PCI card from Universal Audio. Uh, obviously, it's not vital to use third-party plug-in virtual instruments. If your DAW comes bundled with loads of instruments, if you're a beginner, you've probably got enough to get on with and they sound very, very good. After that, all the other stuff uh, that I've mentioned from the third-party are, are probably for when you start being a bit more discerning about the, the sound, how a different compressor works, a different EQ works. You know, don't rush into buying those because everybody says that you need to have them. Take your time, it's part of the learning process. Okay, so now that you have all your equipment properly connected, set up in your home studio, it's time to make music. You can head to pontblankmusicschool.com to check a range of courses, mixing, production, songwriting, from one single module to entire BA Hones. You can also check our YouTube channel for more tutorials and uh, our, our blog as well. So thank you everyone for watching.